What's going on guys? I'm John Hasselbauer, golf writer for thelines.com, and in this video we'll be going over the 2023 Valspar Championship uh, tournament, everything you need to know before you get your bets in. Uh, before we get any further into that, make sure you are subscribed to the Lions YouTube channel. It's a huge week for the Lions this week. Uh, I myself am a huge college basketball fan, Syracuse proud, once proud, not, not as proud this year, but generally proud alumni of Syracuse University, which means that uh, March used to be a very uh, topical time, a time of hope um, for me. And, and, you know, in years past, in my, my days in college, I was very clued into March Madness, but my interest in March Madness kind of, or college basketball in general, kind of ebbs and flows with the quality of, of my alma mater. Um, so in times like these where I haven't had much to cheer for, I really lean on the other people who are much smarter than me and much more in tune with what, everything that's going on in March Madness to guide me through my brackets. And uh, that is what the Lions uh, does better than th better than most, I would say, in the spirit of, of last uh, week's <laughs> of last week's Players Championship. Uh, there is so much content on the Lions, both the Lions.com and the YouTube channel going game by game, matchup by matchup, bracket region by bracket region. Um, everything you need, whether it's a podcast format, YouTube channel right here, or a written form on the on the website, they have got you covered uh, from every angle for March Madness this year. So make sure you're checking that out and make sure you are subscribed to the channel so that you don't miss any new uh, updates. I will always plug everybody at the lines, but this week especially, um, I, I can't stress enough how great the content is in the college basketball space and how clueless I am of everything that's going on, but how much smarter I'm about to be just by watching uh, and consuming all the content that we have on the site. Um, if you're like me and you're a golf sicko and you're, and you're more interested in the Valspar Championship than uh, March Madness this week and, and all of your time is focused on getting your lineups ready and getting your card filled out before tee off on Thursday, then you have come to the right place because we are going to go over everything you need to know about the Innisbrook Resort Copperhead course ahead of tee off. Um, before we get into that, though, obviously last week was the Players Championship. Want to spend a little time recapping uh, the week that was and, and what it means for the season going forward. Uh, Scotty Scheffler obviously boat raced the field once again, very reminiscent of his dominance at the Masters. Um, as I was kind of watching that event, I did think about betting Scotty Scheffler uh, on a future at the at at the Masters. I did not. Uh, there were twelves and thirteens there. I think it's uh, it's all down below nine. Um, I put a poll out on Twitter: Who do you think the favorite at the Masters should be? Uh, I think if I put that poll out. Two weeks ago, it uh, would have been a, un a unanimous John Rahm. Maybe after Rory was in contention at the API, people might have still said Rory. Um, but it was like 85% Scotty. And, and I think Scotty is still, if not, he's not the consensus favorite. So if you do like Scotty, I think you can still find a 10 to 1 if you want to do that. Um, I missed, I mean, not that 12 is a much better number, but I, I missed the boat on it. Um, and, and that's okay. I'm going to wait to be patient, hopefully some odds drift and masters week. Um, but it is, it is frightening to see somebody like Scotty Scheffler who doesn't wow you with the way he plays, but he doesn't make any mistakes. And I think that this is what it was like sweating anyone, but Scotty Scheffler at the masters last year, where he wasn't perfect off the tee. He wasn't perfect on approach and he had these double cross misses, um, but every time he was in trouble, he was just able to scramble and, and chip it to, to five feet or chip in like he just continues to do. Um, and it, it's kind of, yeah, it is kind of like the Jordan Spieth run of dominance in his day. And he, Spieth was, uh, was interviewed as well after the round and said like, yeah, I know what it feels like to step over a chip and, and think it's going in when you've got it all. And it frees you up when you're playing well to, to take on some riskier like flop shots and stuff. We're seeing that with Scotty. So he's got everything in the bag. He's so young. He's going to do this for a while, I think. And it is, it's interesting how on a week to week basis, the consensus world number one has changed basically for like four or five weeks in a row. Um, I think it's very cool. I would say it's a two man race between uh, Scotty Scheffler and John Rahm to to say just by the eye test who's the best player in the world right now. 
Um, I do think what would probably changed after last week's performance is Scotty Scheffler might have the best A game in the world. And I don't think anybody would have said that before the players, but you look at what he did to a loaded field, both this week and at the masters where he was on his game and nobody else was, was unblemished in the way that he was. He's, he's winning the players and the masters in, in, um, just no doubt form like there there's just nobody anywhere near him on the leaderboard and he, when he gets it going and he gets streaky he is unconscious um which does not make for very compelling golf unfortunately um from from my betting card standpoint tom ho gave us the best sweat we had and he made it on the cut line so um you know not not a great sweat week but i guess if you're gonna have not your best um outright card week let it be because the eight to one favorite kind of asserted his dominance on the field uh also disappointing week for colin morikawa you know he's he came out the gates minus seven it's uh you know one stroke off the first round lead we thought vintage colin might be back he's had a few top fives already to start this season and he just could not have looked worse with the putter. I mean, how many six foot birdie putts can you miss in a round? Uh, he's going backwards on moving day Saturday, shooting over par while while Tom Hoagie is is breaking the course uh, record in the same conditions. And Hoagie and Morikawa, we we knew going into that week were the two best uh, the best iron players in the field. And Hoagie actually made some putts, so he shoots you know double digits under par, and Morikawa can't can't you know find water from boat. Um, and he's struggling to, to, you know, shoot even par. Um, so that's, a, that's a tough break at the end of the day, nobody was beating Scotty, so it doesn't matter, but it is a little frustrating whenever you're on an outright, who's clicking, uh, with the ball striking and just can't seem to find the bottom of the cup. Last thing I will say with, with, with Morikawa too, um, I was obviously on, uh, Keegan Bradley last week as well. He was pretty active in the media circuit and something that he's been saying a lot in the press junket whenever he gets interviewed is um, the improvements that he's made to his putting have been a credit to Aimpoint Express. And it's not anything technical he did with his swing. Obviously, he had the the arm lock um, broomstick style putter earlier in his career, and he had to kind of reinvent the way he putts, and that took some time. But once he got acclimated to the new stroke and, and he would go to putting coaches and, and they would review what he's doing, they're like, yeah, you're, you're hitting it square off the center. You're, you're putting it online. The issue why you're not making putts is your aim. Um, and so that's literally all Keegan did was, was get better at getting the ball to start on plane when he's lining up his putts and reading greens better. Uh, I say all this to say like watching Colin Morikawa, I think it's an aim problem. And I'm curious if he if he's ever been asked about Aimpoint Express. I don't think he's out there doing it. Um, but every single putt he had, he left on the high side. He's playing like a foot, like a ball and a half above the hole, and it breaks a half ball, and he misses it on a good stroke, on a good line, on a good roll, and it just is never going to break as much as he's playing. Um, so I don't know. I'm not a golf putting coach, but I thought that was interesting that Keegan had it, it so simply put that like, yeah, I just wasn't aiming it right, but my putts were, were looking good. And then you immediately watch Colin Morikawa and it's like, he's going to miss this high because he's missed the last six putts high. Uh, and he does it. So we'll see. I think it's something to monitor. I'm, I'm now scathed from a Colin Morikawa outright. Uh, we'll see. Uh, you have to kind of wait for the odds to dip even further at this point. Cause I just don't have the confidence that he's going to hit enough putts to win a big tournament. Um, currently as it stands, obviously he's won two majors. He's capable of doing it, but I don't know. I, I think I need to see a little bit more consistency with the putting from him. Um, and, and the other thing I'll say too is, is I'm really impressed by Victor Hovland and they're going to be compared to each other. Hovland more call their entire careers. Um, I think Hovland gets a little bit of an unfair reputation as somebody who can't win a big event because of the around the green game. I've always said, if there's one area of your game, that's going to be bad. Let it be around the green because if you have a great ball striking week, you're only, you're going to you know have a small percentage of holes that you even have to get up and down for. And if you're a great putter, then if you're hitting your chips to eight feet while everybody else is hitting them to five feet, but you're hitting the eight footers, then it really doesn't matter. Um, and that's kind of what, what Hovland's done. So yes, he makes a, a mess out of these like tricky 
you know, caught in a bunker, can't get up and down, you know, uncomfortable lie around the green. He's not going to be Scotty Scheffler and just chip in when he's in a tough spot. Um, but he's an elite ball striker. And when you compare Hovland and, and Morikawa, it's really like ball striking wise, you, you expect them to do the same. And Victor has a little bit extra distance. And I put a poll on Twitter for this too, but it really does come down to like, if you're deciding between Victor Hovland and Morikawa, do you, do you want to sweat some up and downs from Vic when he's missing the green? Or do you want to sweat these six foot birdie put, putts from, from Morikawa? And after last week, after enduring the Morikawa sweat all week, I'm kind of siding with Vic. Like I'll, I'll take my chances. If he's going to hit a high percentage of greens and regulation, I'm confident he's going to hit more putts. Um, and when he's off the green, like he's going to make a mess of certain holes, but in general, he does get up and down. He's not, he's not the worst chipper on tour and he's super young. He's only going to get better. So I think Vic, Vic is a better player than Morikawa right now. I don't know if that's a hot take, but, um, I'm going to be looking his way as long as it's not like a pure scrambling contest. Um, and he's not even in this field, so it doesn't matter, but you know, the next time we're in a, in tough conditions, as long as it's not a pure scrambling contest, uh, I, I think he's going to win a couple bigger, bigger tournaments this year. So we'll have to wait and see on that. Um, but yeah, that's going to do it for, for the players recap now to switch gears into the Valspar championship. Uh, I've got the tournament preview article up right here. As always, you can go to the link in the description, um, to check out that article, uh, or you can go to my Twitter feed at PJ tout, um, to find that, um, in this article, uh, just as a reminder, this will link out to the evergreen page, which has um, all of the, all of the odds, um, historical trends as well as, um, course info. So I'm going to switch over to that for the purpose of this video. Um, and you can see here right at the top of this odds video is your odds grid. One of the best things about, um, these articles on the lines is you can always see where the best number is across all of these sports books. Um, so looking at the field this week at the Valspar championship, it is Justin Thomas, who is your betting favorite at around 10 to 11 to one odds. He has led the field in tee to green at this event in each of the last two years, uh, just hasn't been able to buy a putt in classic Justin Thomas fashion. And um, he actually has gone as far as to skip the WGC match play the next week to play in this event. So maybe that puts a lot of pressure on him to justify it and win here. I don't know. Um, but it is interesting to see that, that he is that confident in his game at this sort of course that he would skip a WGC with a ton of money on the line, um, to play here. He may also just be conceding that he can't beat Scotty Scheffler <laughs> and he's, uh, trying to play in an event that, uh, he has the best chance to be the favorite in. So, uh, can't knock him for that. It, it is nice to see some of the best players still play in these non-designated events and definitely something that I'll be curious to see if that trend continues next year uh, when they're a lot less incentivized to be playing in the non-designated events. After Thomas, you have Jordan Spieth, Matt Fitzpatrick, and Sam Burns are kind of in this top tier. I don't really, I mean, I, I could be wrong here. Just Matt Fitzpatrick is the U.S. Open, but the form hasn't really been there. So I think it's, it's really Thomas, Spieth, and Burns at the top that I would make a decision on if I were to bet this. I, I did bet Justin Thomas at about the same odds here last year on a very short um, card. He was one stroke off the off the playoff between Davis Riley and Sam Burns. So it made for a good sweat. Like Colin Morikow, it's very frustrating to sweat Justin Thomas because he is just not scaring the hole on, on these really short makeable putts, uh, which you hate to see. And Jordan Spieth is kind of the same way. So it's just like a lot of uncomfortable putters as favorites, which usually means I'm going to build a slightly longer card, fade the top and take my chances that they just continue to not putt. Well, uh, I won't go through the, the entire board here, but those are your favorites. And then going down into, it's a full field this week, going down into, um, the course specs so of it is 7,300 yards, a little over 73 par 71 with five par threes, a uh, very unique setup. Only, uh, Cordy Golf Narashino, where the Zozo Championship is in Japan, has that five par three setup. So a little interesting layout. There's also a four par fives, which is unusual for a par 71. So maybe you deprioritize par four scoring, look for your specialists on the threes and fives. That's kind of how I have approached this. 
Um, other notes, they did make the, the fairway slightly narrower and they grew out the rough a lot more. Um, you can see here, if I scroll down, the winning score in each of the last two years when Sam Burns won was 17 under par. Those are both the highest marks of the last 10 years. So usually when that happens, um, they, they try to go out of their way to make the course play even more difficult. This is an event you can see uh, has really lived in that 10 under par or worse uh, winning score. And the median score is usually even about even. So they, it was playing a lot easier the last two years. I think they kind of overcompensated to make it more of a tough test. Um, and then just looking at the trends of winners over the years, you have back-to-backs from Sam Burns and Paul Casey. That is a little unusual. Two kind of different styles of players. Sam Burns is somebody who excels on Bermuda greens and was not exactly a putting specialist, but if you put him on Bermuda, he can win it with his putter, uh, which is what he has done every step of the way uh, at this course the last two years. And then Paul Casey is kind of the opposite. He's not a great putter, but he can ball strike his way through any course. And uh, Innisbrook is going to reward accuracy off the tee and elite long iron play, which are two things that Paul Casey has always done very well. Um, and then in terms of the the, um, the pedigree of players coming in, it is a pretty good mix of favorites and long shots. The odds-on favorite isn't really winning here so much. You can see Jordan Spieth at 16-1 to 1 is the shortest player to win here. Uh, that 25-1 to 1 range is 25-33 is, uh, to 33 is about where half of the winners are coming from. But you have also seen Adam Hadwin at 125-1, to 1, John Senden, Kevin Streelman um, have all won as long shots. So... It is sort of that that type of course where if you are accurate and you can play from the fairway, um, that's going to give you a big leg up here. This is not a bomber's course. You want to avoid the rough, and it is positional where um, you know you can't overpower it. And you need to play from the fairway. So that is something to look out for. That's a skill in driving accuracy that you can find lower down the board, but that long iron approach from 175 plus is what uh, I think is going to set people apart and you know, that's step, step one is hit the fairway. Step two is be pretty consistent from 175 plus. And step three is be a familiar, uh, comfortable putter on Bermuda greens. If you're from the area, from Florida, from the region, um, and you know, Bermuda, well, this is such a pure, um, Bermuda surface, a little overseeded this time of year, but still like a very pure rolling surface that people who tend to do best on Bermuda have, have had a lot of success on Sam Burns in each of the last two years, a great example of that. So that is the preview. We will move it over to the model um, and just tease out uh, who I'm betting this week and who looked good from the key stats that I was looking at. Um, so starting with the overview of the key stats, um, I've sort of sorted it in four categories. So ball striking, short game, scoring, and comp courses. Um, ball striking is going to be a combination of approach, but particularly from 175 plus, and then a smaller secondary weight on strokes gain off the tee and good drive gain to make sure that you are navigating from the fairways. Um, short game, an even mix of around the green scrambling, total putting, and Bermuda putting. I think Bermuda putting is, is really something if you're elite in it, you can actually stand out on this course. Not a requirement, again, as we've seen with Paul Casey, but definitely a nice to have. Uh, we've seen the extremes. If you're a really good Bermuda putter, you can really pop here. Sam Burns and Davis Riley basically putted their way into that playoff last year. And they're both two, two guys from this area who, who just generally putt well in Bermuda. So something to look out for there. Um, scoring wise, par five scoring, par three scoring. Uh, I never really put par three scoring in a model because par threes are not really birdie opportunities and you're really just gaining by avoiding bogeys, but these are all kind of concentrated in that 175 plus, uh, range. And even for, for part fives, that, that range is going to be important for guys trying to reach in two. Um, so I think if you can score on those two in general, that's a, it's a good sign leading in. Um, and then just T degree and form coming in. This is a, a, a tough test, um, from T degree. And so need to be polished up. If you have any blemishes with your short game, or you're not really in the best approach form, that's not good uh, leading into this course. So definitely nice to have there. And then finally, comp courses. So the comp courses for this week, uh, I think uh, TPC Sawgrass is actually one of the better comps. Um, Adam Hadwin went on record. He's a past champion here. And someone who's finished top 15 in the last two years at TPC Sawgrass actually led the field um, in strokes gain off the tee at the players last week. And he was interviewed after his round. Uh, and said that the the 
the sight lines and the types of shots that you need to hit, working it both left to right and right to left, uh, are very consistent at TPC Sawgrass and at Innisbrook. Um, so I think that's really interesting. I'm looking at guys who drove it well last week to try to continue that because it's, it is the same sort of recipe of tee shots. It's, it's three woods where you need to hit it right to left. It's, it's hybrids off the tee where you're hitting a little cut. It's not that many drivers and it, it does actually present a nice buy low opportunity for guys who may, may not be the best, um, drivers on tour, but if you put them on a positional course and let them kind of work in both ways, uh, they actually, you know, can have a, a better path to gaining strokes off the tee. Um, so Sawgrass is a great comp. I actually think um, Riviera is a pretty good comp. Um, Bubba Watson's had a lot of success at both courses. Max Holm has actually had had some really good success here. Uh, Paul Casey's been very good at, at Riviera. And even Sam Burns um, was the 54-hole leader at, at the Genesis a couple of years ago. So not a lot of the same type of field that's playing both events. Um, even Justin Thomas, I'll throw him out there. He's He's been very good. Um, and, and Jordan Spieth. So the, the names kind of go on as I think about it. Uh, Riviera is a, a course that is not super long on the on the yardage, but actually plays longer than it looks and requires you to kind of work it in both ways. Uh, there's also like your, your typical positional Bermuda courses. So your Sedge Fields, uh, Harbor Town, uh, TPC Southwind, I think are also just good comp courses to reference. Uh, places where you have to club down a little bit. They emphasize being in the fairway. And, um, you know, preferably they're also on the same sort of uh, Bermuda greens. So that is the overview of the uh, key stats that I'm looking for. And then if we go into start with the model just to look at who the top 10 was taking that all into account it is my two favorite people in ben griffin and tommy fleetwood so if you are in the lines discord uh we were commiserating together on two of the, like the just the worst beats <laughs> of of the placement card i've had definitely this year and prop maybe you know of the last year uh the way the placements went down at the players uh ben griffin was t12 Going into 18 on Sunday, we had a T30 on him and he made a triple bogey um, after avoiding the water on the tee shot and punching into the water from the tree uh, line and then three putting. Uh, just a complete disaster. If he double bogeys, it's at least a chop. If he bogeys, it's a win. Um, so that was brutal. And then Tommy Fleetwood, after that all happened, we still had Tommy Fleetwood to break even on the props uh, on a top 20. Um, he was T3 or T4 going into Sunday. He started like bogey, bogey, bogey. He went on a birdie streak on the back nine. He was probably T8 or T10 going into 17. Hits a good shot. Hits a water ball, uh, double 17, and he's one stroke outside of the top 20 as well. So it's just just a, a cruel coincidence that Griffin and Fleetwood burned me last week on the um, on the placements, both played well, but not well enough to catch placements. And now they're one and two in the model. Uh, after them, it's Wyndham Clark, who I have very high hopes for this week. Uh, Matthew Neesmith, who has had no form whatsoever this year, but interesting to see after his uh, top three finish last year that he's popping there. Uh, Adam Hadwin at number five, Keegan Bradley at number six, Justin Thomas at seven, Justin Rose at eight, Matt Fitzpatrick at nine and Eric Barnes, interestingly enough at number 10. Uh, he was somebody I threw a, uh, an outright on at the Puerto Rico open at 30 to one and he missed the cut. So I don't think I'm going to go back to him, uh, despite where he ranks in the model. Um, so that's that's who rates out best for this course. And then if we look at, I'm going to filter this by my outright bets. Um, so I'm starting the car with Tommy Fleetwood, um, which kind of hurts because he broke my heart last week just from a placement perspective. I didn't even have an outright on him. Um, but this week, you know, I'm looking at ball striking form and short game on per, on Bermuda. Um, Tommy Fleetwood rates out, I don't have ball striking in here, but he is one of, he actually joins Ben Griffin as the only two players who are top 20 in both, uh, strokes game ball striking over the last 20, 24 rounds and strokes gain putting on Bermuda. So Tommy Fleetwood not really thought of as like a putting specialist by any means. Uh, but when you put him on Bermuda, he has had his best stretches on this Florida swing. He's had some good results at this event and, 
you know, one water ball on 17, uh, if you take that away, it's going to be a top 10 finish. I think we're looking at even shorter odds. Um, I got him at 28 to one. I believe 25s are still out there. And I, and I still think anything over 25 is a good number on Fleetwood, um, kind of in that second tier um, for this week. Uh, Wyndham Clark is my spotlight player of the week. Really interesting trends with Wyndham Clark. Um, he, since the farmer's insurance opened five starts ago, um, going into the players, his four previous starts ahead of the players were the four best approach performances of his career week after week, four weeks in a row, he continued to put his top four approach performances ever. Uh, he was neutral on approach at the at the players last week but he lost two strokes on approach on one tee shot on 17 uh on friday uh at the players so if if he just found the surface um then we would be looking at another top 10 career performance for wyndham clark who over the course of his career has always been this bomber with great short game but he never really completed his game with with approach now the, the approach is Red hot, it's trending. You can see where he ranks now. He's six in in approach. Um, you would never really expect to see that from Wyndham Clark, but he continues to trend in the right direction. This is definitely an approach course, and particularly one from from long range, where we see he's ranking out a twelfth because he's going to have some shorter irons in from one seventy five from two hundred yards. That's probably you know a two hundred yard shot for Wyndham Clark might be uh, I don't know an eight iron. Uh, where for other guys, that's probably like a, a five or, or four iron. So it's going to be easier for him to hold greens. And if he misses them, he's also 10th in strokes gain around the green. So have to feel pretty good about his fit here. Um, and he's also second in par five scoring and second in strokes gain to green leading in. So I got a 45 to one on him. I think it's a great number. He's one of my favorite fits for this course. Um, and I think he's a great value this week. Adam Hadwin, I got a 28 to one. That is a uh, uncomfortable thing to say because he is not a 28 to one caliber golfer most weeks, but I have to say I've been really impressed with his composure in these elevated events. He, he looked good at the U S open, uh, which is when I think I first really started paying attention, um, to, or I guess taking him more seriously. Um, Hadwin is somebody who's only had one career win and it did come here in 2017, I want to say. Um, and, and since then he's contended a bunch, but he's had very sticky course history on these courses where he just rewards playing from the fairway, hitting your irons well and, and putting well, um, that is Adam Hadwin's game. So he's actually been in a little bit of a cold streak with the putter, but long-term he's a very reliable putter. So I think that is bound to change. Um, and it's especially bound to change on Bermuda greens where he's putted his best. Um, so 9,200 on DraftKings and 28 to one is a steep price. But I think if this season has taught us anything, it's that, uh, you, you almost have to buy high on guys because people just keep on trending into wins. Um, so I like Adam Hadwin this week. Um, Trey Mullinax is somebody I got at 160 to one. So he's definitely a long shot, but over his last 12 rounds, he has a win, uh, and five top 15 finishes. Um, so he can spike. He, he's coming off of a, a pretty brutal week last week at the players, but it's easy to have a brutal week at the players. Uh, you find the water once or twice, and all of a sudden your your scorecard uh, crashes and burns. So uh, I'm not too concerned about one bad week for Mullinax. He's always played well on Bermuda. The eight best finishes of his career are all top eights, and they have all come on Bermuda grass. Uh, and he has finished top seven at this event uh, in 2019. So I like the vibes heading in. He's a he's an Alabama uh, Crimson Tide alumni, and they just got the number one seed at uh, the NCAA tournament. So maybe that's a positive vibe for him. And lastly, to close it out, my fifth uh, bet of the week is Denny McCarthy at 40 to one. This is probably a knee jerk reaction to uh, betting Colin Morikawa last week and not being able to see a putt. Uh, a, a ball find the bottom of the cup. Um, so with Denny, if he puts his approaches to 15 feet, I'm feeling better about that than when Colin was putting him to six. So um, similar to Sam Burns, who can win this event on the merit of his putter alone, uh, there's no better long-term putter on Bermuda Greens than Denny McCarthy. So if he's just a little bit better with the ball striking, um, and you can see, or I get I. Mm, 
I actually don't have the 200 plus numbers, but um, from 200 plus, he's bad. Um, he's 132 from 175 plus, but from 175 to 200, he's actually top 30. So there's always flaws with the proximity stats, but I think if he just leaves himself a little bit inside 200, um, that that's a better recipe for Denny. And obviously the short game speaks for himself, top 11 in both scrambling and putting, uh, even this Bermuda numbers over the last 36, he's had a couple tough, like desert, um, showings, but in general, he's been fantastic on the Florida swing and, if he, whenever he does get his first career PGA tour, when I do think it'll come either in Florida or in this Bermuda sort of region. Um, so that's going to do it for my betting card. Uh, it's a tight one this week. I did want to really concentrate towards the top of the board, not in that favorite region, but definitely in like the 20 to 50 range. Um, it's going to be tough conditions this week. They grew out the rough and the wind is going to be up. Um, so I want to have like, you know, just a few guys who, who can handle tough conditions. So, uh, we'll see best. I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed because we haven't really had a close outright sweat. We've been on the periphery the last few weeks. Um, but you know, fingers crossed, I, I've got high hopes for this card this week. Um, so best of luck to you. Hope you guys, uh, found this helpful and, uh, wish you all the best luck at the 2023 Valspar championship. Thank you.